Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 187, October 14th to October 20th, 1864. Last week, we talked about the beginning of Hood's Tennessee campaign in the Battle of Alatoona. That battle is really a good preview of how things are going to go as we get into November and December, so hold that thought. We also talked about the Greenback Raid, conducted by John Singleton Mosby and his Rangers, as well as the death of Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney. This week, we need to fight, really, the climactic battle of the 1864 Valley Campaign. While things were not necessarily be over in this region of the war, it's really just riding up the wall post-Cedar Creek. Before we get into that battle, though, we do need to head to Vermont before the season of the sticks. And before we do that, we do need to talk about some Patreon content. And of course, we have our Crater slideshow posted showing the modern day battlefield of the Crater. And goes very nicely with our episode we had back in July. And of course, we did Cold Mountain as well. And that movie does depict the battle of the Crater. So we have a couple of items that pair very nicely together, although they are a little bit removed from one another. And we have done other picture slideshows in the past. We've done places from a far field as Pea Ridge. And we have also done some of the lesser known sites around places like Richmond. We have done movie reviews, several of them before the war and also during the war. And we might even do a couple that will depict some events after. And we've also done memoir reviews as well. So the eyewitness accounts that are either writing at the time of the events or afterwards in a memoir kind of form, uh, we have reviewed those as well. So if any of that sounds like it would interest you, there is a link in the show description and those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. They're greatly appreciated. Now, why exactly Vermont, you may ask? Well, it might surprise you to know that there was, in fact, a Civil War event that did take place in that state. We may have mentioned very briefly before about how the Confederates were operating in Canada, whether through covert means or otherwise having escaped from federal prisons. One such escaped prisoner was Bennett Young. Young had served in a Confederate Kentucky regiment and was captured during Morgan's 1863 raid, eventually finding his way to Canada. He would go on to produce several works of literature, as well as be known as the father of the public library in Louisville, and also represent a black man against the KKK later in life. Young would gather other escaped Confederates for a planned raid into nearby Vermont, leading the effort despite being only 21 years old. St. Albans is a little north of Burlington and fairly close to the Canadian border. Being a small but prosperous town, Young surmised that he could rob three banks there and then provide some much-needed cash for the Confederacy. Once secured, they could then fire the town. A secondary goal of the raid would be to hopefully draw Union troops north. Remember that the draft riots had taken at least some men away, so the threat from invasion from Canada might do toward the north having to at least send some men to garrison areas they probably had not thought about before. By October 12th, Young was scouting out the town, seeing about possible targets. He would have some 18 to 22 raiders to assist in the endeavor, and eventually plan on October 18th. The 19th, however, would see many of the citizens of the town actually move to Burlington for a market, so the raid was moved to the state. Some of the Confederates would arrive late as well, so postponement of the raid seemed wise. Once gathered, all the raiders were armed with Colt Navy revolvers and were familiar with their targets. The First National, Franklin County, and St. Albans Banks were all going to be intended targets, and an additional hit on a bank in a nearby town was also in the offing. The town of St. Albans had, at the time, a population of some 4,000, 
so making sure they could corral any civilians quickly and efficiently would be the name of the game. Many of the citizens worked at a rail shop, so keeping anyone from alerting this large employer would be important. At 3 o'clock, the raid would begin with a pistol shot by Young. Despite announcing that he was in fact employed by the Confederate Secret Service, and despite the firing of the weapon, many of the town believed it to be a joke. It was taken more seriously when the raiders entered the St. Albans Bank. Any civilian within the bank was rounded up by gunpoint, and deposits were confiscated. Many of the raiders would mention how this was in retaliation to Sheridan's burning of the Shenandoah. Some of the citizens were even forced to swear allegiance to the Confederate States of America. Between three banks and the local hotel, which the raiders had been gathered initially in, some $208,000 had been gathered. The raiders were meanwhile occupied with trying to round up any citizens into a holding area of the village green. One citizen did not believe the threat to be valid and would be shot. Wounded fairly severely, he would survive. Another civilian attempted to flee and was shot, the only fatality of the raid. By this time, much of the town was arming themselves. Captain Conger of the 1st Vermont Cavalry, veterans of Farnsworth's charge at Gettysburg, was on leave and would organize a defense and eventual pursuit. One raider would be wounded as the town began to fire back. Young would realize that flight was necessary. The raiders would attempt to use Greek fire, however they would fail to spark up the town or a subsequent rail bridge with their concoction. Greek fire, of course, is an ancient kind of weapon that can be used and was utilized in history, and it is very hard to put out Greek fire. So that is something they were trying to use to fire the town. However, uh, they didn't quite get it right. Fourteen of the raiders were captured by the Canadian authorities, with the remainder making good on their escape into Canada. Despite a trial, the 14th men were eventually set free, the Canadian government not being able to extradite them to America. A mob had actually tried to apprehend Young in Canada, but he was saved by a British officer. Young would send responses to the St. Albans newspaper during the trial, including a $3 note from one of the banks. Eventually, the money would be reimbursed by the Canadian government. The raid, therefore, really did not have its desired effect. Canadian opinion of the Confederates dropped as diplomatic relations between Canada, England, and the United States were a tad rocky for a while. A failed effort, but probably one of the lesser-known and stranger instances of the war being waged on northern soil. Now, obviously, it also highlights just how desperate the Confederates are becoming It's a common theme as we get into the latter stages of the war here at 64, 65. They're trying to come up with things that they can do to turn the tide, right? Sabotage, trying to shift troops to the north. You know, maybe there is actually some theories about how a war between Canada and England and the United States was not necessarily going to be such a bad thing, right? If we kind of pull England into the conflict. But really, ever since the Trent Affair, there really hasn't been too much of a threat of Great Britain actually entering the conflict. So that's kind of a long shot as well. It's probably as much as a long shot of robbing these banks and getting the money back to the Confederates so they can use. Of course, you're probably just giving it to agents in Canada and they're using it toward buying war material. But, you know, obviously kind of a crazy idea and uh, one that is... uh, pretty lesser known event and something that is pretty interesting to look into. So we will turn our attention back to the Shenandoah Valley. When we were last in the area, Phil Sheridan had won two big victories at 3rd Winchester and Fisher's Hill. Both battles would deplete the ranks of Early, who was already at a manpower disadvantage. Sheridan had set about destroying the resources of the valley thereafter before withdrawing back up to Winchester. Remember, we talked about how Grant had kind of wanted Sheridan to continue moving through the valley and then eventually get on to Richmond by crossing the mountains, and that just really hadn't happened. He was supposed to go to Charlottesville. He was supposed to continue, and then 
they could have hit Richmond from that area as well, you know, tearing up track, doing whatever was necessary to hinder the Confederate war effort. But Sheridan is going to not really bite on that. And it's one of those examples of how, and we've mentioned this in the past, I believe, of how Grant plays favorites, kind of Sheridan is sort of his favorite. He's not really doing what he wants him to do, uh, but he is effective. You know, he has these two battlefield victories. He is depriving the Valley of resources, so you could chalk up some W's there if you're Ulysses S. Grant. But, again, it's not really according to plan. A Sheridan, to his credit, is going to be faced with a lot of raiding to his supply lines. And we talked about the Greenback raid last week. So things like that are happening, and it's going to be making his position as they stretch further into the Valley just that much more tenuous. Early was still determined to strike at the Federals, and with Kershaw's division returned to add some reinforcement, he would prepare. The situation was pretty quiet on the Union side. Many believed that the campaign was over. Early had been bested, and now he was probably at Charlottesville. Some of the troops could potentially be shifted back to Grant. Sheridan even considered just leaving Crook's force to deal with the Valley, while the Sixth Corps and other units were returned to help out at Petersburg. If Early was going to stay away from Richmond, then it was a pretty solid assumption that more troops to break the siege at Petersburg could be useful. Grant was still hoping that Sheridan would move to a position to better help his siege. While Early had in fact been beaten, that was only one of the goals of the Valley Operations. And as we mentioned, of course, cavalry raid to take out Charlottesville and Gordonsville, those were two big things in the offing. Sheridan was starting to gather his forces at Front Royal for this effort. Early, though, would move north in October, Kershaw's command conducting a reconnaissance in force on the 13th. They would set up at a place called Hupps Hill, which lay before the Union line. The Federals had dug in across Cedar Creek, but Confederate artillery would prod two brigades into action, the Federals advancing and engaging in a firefight with the Confederates. Thoburn's command would be one's to engage James Connor of Kershaw's division. One brigade, under Thomas Harris, would be turned back, while the second brigade, under George Wells, would arrive in support. Wells would be mortally wounded in the action, while on the Confederate side, Connor would be wounded, causing his arm to be amputated. Both sides would disengage, the Confederates suffering some 180 casualties compared to 214 Federals. Well, this was just a probe by the Confederates, they did have the upper hand in the engagement, so that's probably going toward the morale of the army, having suffered two pretty heavy defeats. However, in the long run, it's actually going to potentially backfire for early. Troops that were being sent away were recalled to Sheridan, whose forces would start to dig in. Early would see that their left anchored on Massanutten Mountain. The right would have to be turned. But there was enough troops to check that effort. John Gordon, along with Jedediah Hotchkiss and Clement Evans, would move to a position to try to figure out a different plan. Gordon realized that there was a path through the mountains, albeit a sketchy one. At one point, it was only wide enough for a single-file line. If Evans, Ramsour, and Pegram could get through, though, they would be in a perfect spot to roll up the federal line. Kershaw could continue to check Thoburn, and Wharton could fill in further north, as well as cavalry, hopefully pinning the enemy into place. You can see how this is kind of a reverse of Fisher's Hill, right? Like, there is a supposed anchor to the line that the enemy cannot get around, but here we have a path in which the Confederates could exploit. There could be a flanking movement that then would exploit the rest of the line. Jubal Early, despite bumping heads with Gordon, probably being jealous of his subordinate, would actually adapt the plan and set things in motion for everything to be in position on October 19th. The plan would include Kershaw's assault, but would begin with Thomas Rosser's cavalry pressing on the cavalry pickets to the north. If possible, he was to cut off the Valley Pike. Additional Confederate cavalry would be tasked with getting at Sheridan at his headquarters at Bell Grove. However, Sheridan was not home. You see, Phil Sheridan had gone to meet with Halleck and Stanton to defend his strategy of not moving into a position to threaten Charlottesville. Instead of continuing to the army, he would remain in Winchester as the battle began. With skirmishing underway, 
on part of the cavalry, Kershaw would jump into action against Crook. Luck was on the side of the Confederates that morning, as not only was there a heavy fog, but also Wright had ordered a reconnaissance early that day, so any movements were assumed to be the action of the Federals and not hostiles gearing up for an assault. Kershaw's command would see some success in driving the enemy, therefore. We have an account from a member of Kershaw's command. On the afternoon of October 18th, my regiment, 10th Georgia, camped on Fisher's Hill, which borders Cedar Creek Valley, west of Strasburg with orders to be ready to move at 2 o'clock the next morning and to leave off everything, though it would rattle or make noise. Sheridan's army was strongly fortified on the hills east of the creek. About start time the next morning, the regiment was formed and marched out, leaving the little town of Strasburg to our left. Colonel William C. Holt was in command. We did not go very far, probably one and a half miles, until we came to the creek. The Yankee pickets fired on us. We drove them off and waded over the creek and formed a line of battle on the west side, with only our regiment in this column. The order was furnished. We marched up a hill, about 100 yards, with the battery shelling us from the time we struck their picket line at the creek, but this did very little damage until we got to the very top of the hill. We were going due east, and day was just breaking, which gave us the advantage of what little light there was. I could see the line of breastworks about 50 or 60 yards in the front, and the Yankees' heads moving up above them. I remarked to Lieutenant Herndon, who was marching by my side, Look out, we're going to catch it. And just at that time, the whole line opened fire on us from the breastworks, which made a single sheet of fire in our front. That really done us more damage than all the balance of the day's fighting, killed and wounded scores of our boys. But that was all the looks they got at us. Then and there, we gave the rebel yell and ran right in and scattered them like shaft before the wind. We captured their battery of six guns and then turned it on them giving them great canister, shot on shells as they went over the next ridge. They had tree chops sharpened and set any number of limbs in from their breastworks, but I didn't know it until I lodged in them. We formed across their line and moved up the line to another battery they had to the left of the Moore Pike Road leading down the Shenandoah Valley. Though we did not have more than half a skirmish line for the space as it had come, but we doubled back and took the battery, making 12 guns we had taken, and routed the whole line completely, half mile long, with one depleted regiment. But just before we got over the breastworks at the second battery, I was shot, and so was Colonel Holt. Our artillery officer shot us both with the Colt's repeater just across the breastworks. Colonel Holt was wounded in the knee, and I was shot through the hips, wounding the withers and rectum. I was wounded about sunrise, It was cold that morning, a big frost, and I bled freely. And being wet from wading the creek, I got very cold. Lieutenant Stovall was then adjacent of the regiment, and when he noticed my condition, he gave me a canteen of apple brandy. Said he, drink it, it'll stimulate you. I took a drink or two, but being wounded as I was, it burned me like fire or hot water. But I hung it on my neck. So we have a couple things to unpack here in this account, and it is showing you just how surprising the Confederate attack was. And it's not really a whole lot of men who are making the assault. Kershaw actually sees good success, even though the flank is crumbling. Uh, He does see actually good success in his initial assault. So we have a pretty good account of that, in that they're not really a whole lot of guys that are attacking. These regiments are depleted at this point. They've been campaigning, campaigning for several years now, and they are still advancing and, and seeing some success, these veteran troops. The Army of West Virginia would form up to face the Confederates. This would include Howard Kitching and his heavy artillery regiments in the Provisional Brigade. Before they could respond, Gordon would smash into the flank, victimizing the 34th Ohio 1st. Clement Evans would command his division with Pegram supporting and Rimsey were on the right. They would drive away Crook, capturing many men in the process. Hayes and then Thoburn's division would melt away. Thoburn and Kitching would both be killed in the action of trying to stop the men from crumbling. Many of the Union troops were captured in their tents, and bedrolls so quickly was the action. Confederates would pause to raid the Union camp, as many were in need of food and supplies. Henry DuPont would do good work in saving the artillery pieces from capture, an action that would actually earn him the Medal of Honor. Heavy fog had come down and blanketed the battlefield, and that was a good thing if you were attacking, but it would also hide the artillery, so while a blessing, it was also a curse for the Confederates. 
and good for Henry Dupont, who was unable to escape. As it was, Kershaw's command did capture part of the battery in the initial attack. Emery's command would start to turn to face the oncoming command of Gordon, who would continue to roll up the Union line. The division under McMillan would try to stop the rebels. Henry Thomas's brigade, including the 12th Connecticut, 160th New York, and 8th Vermont, would stand for a time, his brigade suffering heavy casualties, almost a whole third of their number. The 114th New York, who had suffered a third Winchester, would lose half of their number in this stage of the action. The 128th New York would also stand bravely in the face of the oncoming Confederates, but would be forced back. McMillan and Grover would both break, the fugitive stream back toward Winchester. The 6th Corps, which was further up their line, would be next, with Whedon and Kiefer forming into a defensive line beyond the Valley Pike. Some of Getty's men, including the old Vermont Brigade, setting up near a cemetery. This would also be in the vicinity of Bell Grove, where Wright had scrambled to try to make heads or tails of the oncoming Confederates. In a critical moment of the battle, Gordon would stay with the attacking division of Clement Evans, which was hitting Ricketts, who had taken command of the Corps. Ricketts would be wounded during this stage of the action, with Getty taking his place, with Lewis Grant of the Vermont Brigade also taking charge of the division. His men standing firm in the face of the attacking rebels, although Kershaw was pressing from across Cedar Creek, and Evans was advancing out across Meadow Brook, running relatively parallel with the Valley Pike. The fog had helped the Confederates early, but it most likely hampered their efforts at this stage of the battle. Stephen Dodson Ramsur, who had recently been given word his wife had given birth to a child, was in charge of his division, as well as a smaller command of Pegram. Until this point, the men in Pegram's command had been kept in relative reserve. Ramsur would pause, uncharacteristic of his aggressive style. Artillery now was supporting the Yankees to his front, and so advancing without knowing where he was going would seem to be a bad call. If he had been aware of the dispositions of the Federals, he may have been able to send Pegram on a flank through a nearby sediment of Middletown, and thus end up on the left of the Sixth Corps, and possibly even in their rear. The action would have made the initial assaults of the Confederates complete, as the other Union units had been scattered. Ramsour, though, would instead commit his units piecemeal without a general attack, allowing the Federals to parry each thrust. George Washington Getty's command at the Middleton Cemetery would do good work in saving the Federal Army. With this successful defensive action, they would then pull back to the rest of the command. You see, already there had been efforts to try to set up a new defensive line north of Middletown. I've seen in some sources how differently things could have been had Gordon remained with Ramsour instead of veering off with his old division. The Sixth Corps would thus still remain intact, with the cavalry as well withdrawing in an orderly fashion. Custer had been able to check Rosser, Merritt rejoining the mounted defense for the Federals. Still, Getty was going to be the only real defense along with his mounted arm. Rumors had circled that the rest of Longstreet's command had arrived on the field, so the cavalry moved to the main field of action, Rosser unable to hold their attention. Now, there's a lot of fingers that get pointed at each other after this battle, and of course we have this as the primary criticism, shall we say, of Gordon and his action. Had he remained with Ramsour, he might have overruled him and been like, hey, no, you need to continue with this action, right? If we flank the Federals here through the town, we can completely cut them off. And imagine what, and it, we, I know that's always a what if, right, with the Civil War and these actions. We talked about it very recently at North Anna, not too long ago, where an entire corps could have been cut off. And essentially, you know, Warren's Corps in, in that action might have been completely eliminated. And it is very hard to destroy an army. We've talked about that before. It's not the same, quite the same as the Napoleonic actions, but this would have been a big victory for the Confederates. Had the entire Sixth Corps been removed from the equation, the rest of Cedar Creek might not have turned out the way that it was. Maybe there would have been more troops that would have had to been funneled to this area. Now, that's also not to say that just because Gordon goes with Clement Evans, that completely loses the battle. But in a situation where we're critical of Jubal early, I think we can also be critical of Gordon. With the Federal Army in full retreat, the battle was assumed to be over by many, 
including Jubal Early. His troops had smashed their opponents and had some hard-won spoils to enjoy. This would be the last and most egregious time Early would underestimate Phil Sheridan. Sheridan had been alerted to the combat, and not being on the field would realize by the retreat that things were not going well. An option that was on the table for the Federal General would be to form up near Winchester and hit Early the next day, but Little Phil would change that to just beating him right then and there. What followed was Sheridan's famous ride. He would gallop his horse, Rinzi, down the Valley Pike, calling on his infantry to rally. Amazingly, this would seem to work. Early and Gordon would bicker about the events that would lead to the latter stage of the battle. Gordon would write that he was the one to press the importance of finishing off the Sixth Corps, while Early would refuse, and actually refute that. As it was, the Confederates had essentially fought one battle that day, many of them very tired and enjoying whatever spoils they had found in the Union camps. Early would also point to the presence of the Federal Cavalry as a reason to not keep pressing. But the reality was that Pegram's division had been thrown in unnecessarily, something Gordon might have been at fault with. Lomax's cavalry was trying to get to the flank of the enemy and would be off the field entirely. Wofford's brigade of Kershaw's command had been unused, so, if you were to combine all these forces, the day might still have been won. Much blame is to be placed on Early, and part of this is Gordon's recollections after the war, so we should take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Now, Early should have remained aggressive. He should have pressed the Federals. This is very true. But one of the other things that we need to point out with Gordon and his recollections is that we do need to take them with a grain of salt because he's citing these intelligence sources that would not have been available to him at the time. So he's kind of recreating a little bit of history here and saying, you know, here's here's what I had available to me at the time when there was no way he would have been able to know that. And so we often, again, sort of uh, vilify Jubal Early, shall we say, uh, from a Confederate perspective. And then Gordon is usually getting you know, A plus the gold stars here, but I think there's a little bit more, if you look into it, there's a little bit more to it than just that. What is sure is that Early would end offensive action in the afternoon, yet curiously, he would not find a good defensive position to face any Union counterattack, and a counterattack was coming. Sheridan would call for an attack late in the afternoon. First, he was to make sure that the rebels did not, in fact, have reinforcements on the way. To this, he would turn to the cavalry, Charles Lowell being killed, attacking an enemy battery. But the intelligence that only Kershaw was on the field had been acquired, and thus everything was ready to renew the combat. His command would rumble forward, the cavalry pressing on the flanks of the Confederates. In the center of the line, the rebels would hold for a time. In fact, this was very similar to 3rd Winchester, with significant casualties being suffered by the reformed commands. But Custer on the right flank and Dwight's command of the 18th Corps would be able to put the enemy to flight, hitting the flank of the Confederates. Cavalry pouring in on the flanks would see the line crumble. Perhaps the memory of 3rd Winchester was too fresh, but the Confederates would re retreat and turn it into a rout. Dots and Ramsur would attempt to rally the troops before a ball passed between both lungs, a wound that would prove mortal. He would be captured by the advancing Federals, George Armstrong Custer, Wesley Merritt, and Henry DuPont, all keeping vigil with their former West Point classmate. With the Rebels getting across Cedar Creek, the battle was essentially over. Much of the captured wares and baggage were forced to be abandoned by the pressing cavalry. The Rebels would return to Fisher's Hill before moving out, the Union Army had once again seen the worst of terms of casualties, 5,700 compared to 3,000, but with Early's army at the manpower disadvantage and driven from the field, it was defeat that the Confederates would not recover from. It may surprise you to know that this will not end the Valley Campaign of 1864. The troops with Early will be reassigned to Richmond. Early would remain with a small force in this region, having fallen out of favor with Lee. Remember what he does with commanders who are disappointing or subpar is that he just makes sure they're no longer with him and his army. So even though this isn't necessarily an entire theater away, Early is sort of banished. Sheridan will likewise remain in the valley until the latter stages of the war. 
eventually joining Grant before Appomattox. But what should we make of these battles? Was Sheridan really a great tactician? Well, not really. He has a good plan at 3rd Winchester, but it could have been foiled. Early's deployment at Fisher's Hill was puzzling, which allows for Crook to get into position, and Cedar Creek almost became a disaster that might have completely torn down anything that Sheridan had built. Cavalry was definitely an advantage. We can fully say now that the mounted arm of the Federals is surpassing that of the Confederates. And to add into that, Early does make some puzzling calls. Now Sheridan does have the benefit of commanding a much larger force than Early, but there still might have been something that Early could have done. He has the veterans in his command, and despite there being veterans too in Sheridan's outfit, he does have more replacements. Generally speaking, the infantry of the Confederates, despite being less in numbers, is usually a little bit superior than that of their Union counterparts. But here's the bottom line, at least in my mind, this is my opinion, in that if you don't win, then you really have nothing to argue with. And even though there are instances where Phil Sheridan, again, is not the best general, he's not the best army commander, he's not even doing what Grant wants him to do, right? He still wins these battles. And that's really the important thing that I can say to kind of some of these campaign Sheridan wins. So with that, we will bring this week's episode to a close. We had a raid on St. Albans in Vermont, which is a lesser known event of the war, and we fought the Battle of Cedar Creek. This will conclude the Valley Campaign, essentially. Next week, we'll backtrack and head out west. We need to cover the beginning of Price's 1864 raid, notably the setup and setback that will occur at Pilot Knob. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>